Close to 7 million people have been displaced due to fighting in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Why has there been no end to the attacks by the M23 proxy rebel militia? Workers at Seoul's Metro Services have launched a strike. What are their demands? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, if you haven't hit that subscribe button, please do. Close to 7 million people have been displaced in fighting in the Democratic Republic of the Congo or DRC. The fighting is taking place between the Congolese army and the rebel group M23, a proxy militia armed and backed by the DRC's neighbour Rwanda. Now it has been going on for many many months despite the presence of soldiers from the regional bloc that's the East African community and UN peacekeeping forces. In fact, these foreign peacekeeping forces are extremely unpopular in the DRC. Meanwhile, the country is also heading towards presidential elections. We have with us Kambale Musawali for more. Kambale, thank you so much for joining us. Very alarming figures coming out of the DRC. The number of uh, the number of refugees touching around seven million, fighting continuing for fighting has been going on for a long time. In the meanwhile, we are also hearing about uh, reports of what other regional forces, UN forces, being completely ineffectual at this point. So we'll go to we'll go through these one by one. But first of all, could you maybe describe the situation on the ground right now? Where is the fighting uh, really uh, at its peak? The numbers, as you say, is close to 7 million now, uh, displaced Congolese uh, in their home country. Uh, they are moving away from their homes due to the fighting taking place between uh, government forces and proxy rebel militias, particularly the M23. Uh, anytime we talk about the M23, I always assist. This is a proxy rebel force backed, supported, financed, and equipped but the Rwandan military, the Rwandan Defense Force, um, the Rwandan government, uh, the UN uh, itself with the UN group of exp uh, experts have documented in multiple reports the supports that the Rwandan government provides to the M23. This is happening in total impunity. Unfortunately, uh, the Congolese people are bearing the brunt of this war uh, where to stay alive, uh, they have to continuously move. And when they move, I mean, just think about it in context. Let's say if I am in DRC, in the in the eastern part of the DRC today, and fighting take place, I'm living in constant fear of my life that every day I must be ready to move to another place. Whenever I'm moving to other places uh, for safety, uh, I may die, not by, by the bullet, but because of the conditions in which I'm living, whereby you know, I could catch cholera, I could catch diseases, um, I could hurt myself. There are so many things that could happen uh, to any individual in these circumstances. So when we're talking about 6.9 million people uh, displaced, we really have to think about it as human beings, you know, a family, uh, you know, parents with the children, uh, children who can't even go to school anymore because uh, they have to be displaced. But this is happening today. You know, the world, people are reading that in articles, the world knows. Uh, world governments know this is going on, but there is no action uh, to bring an end to the conflict in the Congo that has taken the lives of over 6 million people since 1996 and continue up until today. Right. Kamal, in this context, of course, uh, we're hearing also about the East African uh, regional community forces. And we've talked about this before on the show and all, and a uh, show as well. And of course, they're uh, reaching the end of their mandate. So why is it that there is now very clear clarity, it seems, in the DRC that this mandate will not be extended? The Eastern African community uh, forces came into DRC to support the Congolese uh, government to bring an end to the conflict in Congo, to stop rebel militias. That the way it was presented, it was this regional force coming finally to end the crisis in the Congo. Few months after they arrived, uh, we noticed with the commanders there, they clearly were saying that they are not in Congo to fight rebels. Uh, they are there for peacekeeping, uh, which, which is disturbing for Congolese. Why? Because already, we have the United Nations forces. Right? The UN peacekeepers are in the DRC. One of the uh, it's the largest contingent of UN troops anywhere in the world with a 1.2 billion dollar budget. 
they've been there for a decade, uh, over two decades now, almost two decades. Uh, with their presence in DRC, we have not seen peace. So there has been an eternal push in the Congo for the UN forces to leave. The people themselves have called for that. So hearing that there is a, an African solution, right, presented as an African solution of having countries part of the East African community send their troops, that brought hope uh, to some of the Congolese people saying that, you no, know, finally we're going to have peace. But then after that, you observe that while we have the East African community forces in DRC, towns are being taken by rebels, particularly the town of Bunagana. Bunagana is a town in the eastern part of DRC. For over a year, this town is no longer in control of Congo. It's literally being run as a separate entity outside of the Congo with their own taxation, full control of rebel uh, groups, right in front of uh, East African community forces. So that's what has been disturbing. And the Congolese people have put pressure on the Congolese government saying, if the ESC uh, forces are in DRC doing the same thing as the United Nations forces, they also must leave. Uh, and there have been major protests in the town of Goma, uh, where Congolese took it to the streets, demanding that the ESC forces leave, as well as the uh, UN forces leave. Unfortunately, uh, that protest uh, was uh, violently repressed. Hundreds of Congolese were killed uh, during that time. And the accountability for the chain of command, uh, who within the Congolese army gave the order uh, to kill civilians, uh, the chain of command has not been held accountable. Just uh, low-level uh, soldiers who have been uh, found guilty in military court. So in essence, Congolese people are yearning for peace. They're yearning for security. They're yearning to live another day without fear of death. Unfortunately, the solutions being presented with you know, a military operation or military forces coming to the DRC is not solving uh, the problem of the, of the Congo because we know what's at the root of it. After we discuss all these uh, symptoms of the conflict, the fundamental issue that we are facing in the Congo is that there is a scramble for Congo's mineral wealth, right. uh, particularly minerals such as cobalt uh, used in electric vehicle, minerals such as coltan used in cell phone. So the scramble of Congo's minerals is manifesting itself by chaos, by war, by war of aggression by Congo's neighbor Rwanda and Uganda, who keep the Congo destabilized so that resources can live at a cheaper cost illegally where Congolese people are not benefiting. Unfortunately, we the Congolese are the ones who are suffering at the end and we're calling on the world, we're calling on Africans, uh, we're calling on any person of goodwill to lift up the voice of the Congolese knowing that even in this chaos, Congolese are still in the fight to determine their own affairs. They are hoping uh, to have an election where their voice will be heard even though it's going to still be contentious, but they are still fighting following the ideas and uh, values of Patrice Lumumba, our first prime minister uh, in 1960. Pat Gambale, you mentioned the elections. That is what I was going to ask next. And we know that, again, we have done uh, episodes of Debrief in the past where we have talked about the major questions regarding the process itself, whether it would be fair uh, at this point. Now we are you know, halfway through November. So could you also maybe give us a picture of what the electoral scenario is like right now? The, the elections in the Congo is uh, worrisome. It's worrisome because, one, as I said, Congolese are yearning to choose their own leaders. They are yearning to be able to um, have, have control of their own affairs. But they have so much challenges around them. And they, will, they, they have to face them and they will surmount them. So what's the context of the elections? There was an election in 2018 that took place. And in 2018, uh, Felix Chisekedi was declared the winner of the election. Many indications around the world already show us that this election was more by so many irregularities that he did not win. And actually, the likely winner of the election was a gentleman by the name of Martin Fayoulou. He's also running again in this election. What's worrisome about the 2018 election 
from 2018 to now in 2023, so a month before the presidential election, about a month before the, the presidential election, we still don't have the uh, detailed result of the elections. Hmm. We don't know, poll by polls, what were the results. So we have an electoral commission in the Congo in 2018 came to the world and say, this is the winner. This winner won by X percent of votes, yet did not release the results. So we're going to the next election uh, now with the same issues, right? That we do not know what the electoral commission is going to do. But what has been happening that's creating this uh, worry for the elections? Journalists are being arrested. We have Stanis Bujakera, who has been arrested for an article that was not penned by him. Right? There is an editorial article that was written in a newspaper called uh, Jeune Afrique, an editorial with no names. But in the Congo, he was arrested. What was this article about? It? The article was documenting the assassination of a member of parliament. Right? A, the MP Okende was kidnapped in DRC while in a parking lot of the constitutional court because he was called into the court. And the next day after that, he was found dead in his car with bullets in his body. So Jean Afrique published an article with anonymous sources about that killing. A journalist working for the newspaper is in jail today. And he's not being released. There was actually an appeal um, on a few days ago demanding a temporary release for him, for Bell. Still denied. It's still there. So that worries us that journalists, it's not the only journalists who's being targeted. Many journalists who are following what's happening with the elections and the situation in Congo are being repressed. I mentioned the MP has been also uh, killed. Opposition leaders in the campaign trail are also being targeted. Uh, Martin Fayulu was in a campaign trail in the Kasei region, and he was his campaign was stolen by supporters of the current regime while he was in the Kasei region. Um, not only that, uh, let's look at the electoral process. They instituted a new voter roll in DRC where everyone needed to go to re-register. Right? Not, it's not to update the uh, voter roll, but they had to re-register for a new card. And the ID card that was presented by the Electoral Commission is a black and white ID card. Anyone who has already you know, taken their ID card, most of them are reporting that their face today is blurred. So we have millions of people who have ID cards where you can't even recognize the face. And we are going to the presidential election. And last, that's also worrisome, is that before the elections, by law, the Electoral Commission is supposed to release the list of polling stations across the country. Right. One month before the elections, we still don't have this list. And we are getting pressure from, unfortunately, as I said, the United States. Can you imagine the U.S. Senate? Uh, I think it's Senator Collins. Um, they are set, sending a letter to President uh, Chisekedi around the electoral process. So the United States is appearing to be on the right side of, of the electoral process in the U.S.C. Right. Now, as mentioning that there should be uh, transparency. And that's why I'm challenging also the African Union. It's very important for Africans to watch what's happening in DRC because DRC today is at the heart of the fourth industrial revolution. In the moment where one of the largest lithium deposits has been discovered in Congo, in Manono, in the moment where we are talking about having electric cars and Congo is the number one producer of cobalt, in the moment where Congo's resources is central to modern day technology. The people of the Congo are fighting to choose their leaders. We have 24 presidential candidates, one of them being a Nobel Peace Prize uh, winner, Dr. Mukwege. 
and in the configuration of the elections, what the people want is a leader who will represent their aspirations. And the outside interference risk having either Chisekedi stay in power because of the international geopolitics or one of the opposition leader coming into power who may or may not uh, change the uh, dynamics of the policies in DRC. But in the, in the final analysis, the people of the Congo want to choose their leader so they can be held accountable. They don't want their leader to be assassinated like Patrice Mumba. They don't want to be um, imposed leaders who do not come from the people. So as we are moving towards the presidential election in December, the way I'm looking at the presidential elections in Congo is that it's predictable uh, that Shisekedi may be declared again the winner of a sham election, and it will be a ra rapport de force between the people and the system, saying that once again, the voice of the Congolese have been stolen. And when that happened, and if that happened, uh, our hope is that the world will stand with the Congolese as they are fighting to determine their fairness. Thank you so much, Kambale, for that very powerful analysis. Like you said, uh, the DRC always a very important country to watch uh, because of the reasons you mentioned as well. And we'll come back to you in the coming weeks as the election comes closer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thousands of Seoul Metro workers launched a two-day strike on Thursday against proposed job cuts. The strike followed a breakdown in negotiations with the operator and it's the second year in a row that industrial action is taking place. Anish joins us for more. Anish, thank you so much for joining us. Recently, we talked about workers in Canada going on strike, hundreds of thousands of workers and now other corners of the world. Seoul's Metro workers, very important uh, you know, segment of workers in a city where this forms a huge part of transport. Now also taking, uh, going on protests. So could you maybe tell us what the issue is about? Well, the primary issue here, unlike uh, the kind of work, uh, protests that we talk about, or the strikes that we talk about, uh, it's not really centered around any kind of pay rise. Uh, it's primarily centered around uh, this plan by uh, the contractors uh, or, uh, you know, the facilitators of the Seoul Metro from uh you know for mass layoffs and this is uh so the operators want to actually lay off about close to 13 percent of Seoul metro's uh, uh workforce uh that comes to around 2200 uh workers and uh, about about 360 or so uh alone this year and this uh would actually uh so we are looking at uh you know a sort of uh, layoffs over the next five years and that is actually going to be far more disastrous the reason they are giving is basically that uh, that they are running under deficit. That Seoul Metro itself is running under deficit. It's uh, the total deficit right now is coming to around uh, thirteen uh, billion dollars or thirteen and a half billion dollars. So it's a, it's it has been running under losses ever since the pandemic hit. But nevertheless, there has been very little investments coming from uh, the government, uh, especially uh, under the current uh, uh, the conservative government, and this is actually. Uh, this has actually uh, led to a situation where even though the num uh, the losses have come down significantly over the past two years, uh, it hasn't really translated into actually more benefits uh, for either uh, workers or passengers. So even though the metro system is working far better and even though the footfall has also come back to pre-pandemic levels, uh, the very lack of investments from the government is one of the things that is, uh, you know, preventing uh, uh, this, uh, creating this kind of uh, situation where mass layoffs are seen as an option rather than, uh, you know, more investment into the system. And the uh, the kind of workers that they are trying to lay off will be uh, ones who would be uh, involved in the security or uh, safety uh, network of the metro system. And that is going to be even more problematic because that will impact the manner in which, uh, you know, uh, the quality of service or even, you know, safety of travelers for that matter uh, within the network system. Uh, Seoul, Net Seoul Metro is one of the operator, a set of operators uh, within the entire, you know, subway, Seoul, uh, subway system. But definitely it is one of the biggest operators it operates about nine lines of the Seoul subway uh, system within the metropolitan area, and uh, kind of uh, and caters to millions of people every day. So any kind of uh, cutting down on the safety uh, on workplace safety, uh, especially and creating a shortage of workers, 
uh, is going to create a big problem on the long run. And this is primarily what workers are uh, demanding that the, uh, that the operators go against, not only go against, but also actually include more workers and you know include more people so that there will be there won't be a situation of shortage over the next few years because of retirements and uh, other kind of uh, laying off that might happen. I presume negotiations will continue, but also this taking place even as a significant law seems to have been passed in South Korea regarding the rights of workers. So could you maybe tell us what that's about as well? Yes, yeah, so it is a kind of interesting how this uh, bill got passed. It is called the Yellow Envelope Bill. Uh, basically, it's an amendment bill for the existing labor codes. And what it does is uh, kind of uh, multiple things, but among the key uh, issue provisions that are going to be discussed and will are have been, uh, you know, the part of the contention between the conservatives and the Democratic Party is primarily the fact that it it will put uh, contractors and subcontractors liable for workplace safety and all sorts of damages that might happen, which is uh, something that Korea does not have, uh, unlike most other countries uh, where contractors and subcontractors are the ones who would be pulled up whenever there is any uh, you know, damage or safety issues. Uh, it's usually the workers that are sued and who are, you, uh, who are not uh, permanent workers, who are contracted out, uh, a temporary uh, and more or less like essentially seasonal workers in many respects and are deemed as self-employed under Korean labor laws. So the fact that uh, these uh, contractors and subcontractors will be held liable for their safety as well is something far more significant, a step towards the right direction, definitely, and something that the unions have been talking about for ages now, actually. And uh, at the same time, it will also protect, uh, you know, uh, unions uh, uh, from uh, you know any kind of retributive action for strikes that they might uh, hold. Now, one of the things is that uh, Seoul, uh, not just Seoul, but Korea, South Korea as a whole, has very restrictive set of laws when it comes to strikes, uh, and you can't really completely like there are very few situations or very few sectors that allow for a full-on strike uh, and uh, you know deem them as legal, quote unquote, and uh, you know with uh, you know no pay cuts or anything. But uh, in most cases, workers have to, or trade unions have to arrange for a strike action that does not, you know, completely shut down the industry. Uh, retributive actions have been far more common, especially under the uh, the current conservative administration. And uh, we have seen, we have actually covered in the show as well, how uh, many of the trade unions have been uh, targeted for uh, their strikes, especially uh, organizing more un uh, you know, unorganized set of workers like truck drivers or uh, port workers. And in most of these cases, you have seen several kind of political action uh, or you know, hounding by this current government. So this uh, law kind of uh, targets uh, these kind of uh, political uh, vind and vindictive action, not just from the government, but also from employers and kind of protects uh, workers' rights to mobilize and organize for, uh, you know, better bargaining powers and also for better, uh, you know, better kind of uh, working conditions that they do not really, uh, they, most of them cannot afford to in the current conditions. Well, Anish, thank you so much for that update. Uh, struggles of workers continuing across the world and we'll be tracking all of these as they take place as well. Thank you so much. That's all we have in today's episode of Daily Debrief. We'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Until then, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Watch all our YouTube videos. And if you haven't hit that subscribe button yet, please do.